The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Powermatic and Typebond. It won't take very long after you start woodworking for you to realize that you need project parts that are wider than the boards you have access to. That's when we start gluing boards together to make panels. Now, there's a lot of different techniques, tips and tricks for how to do that, and I'm going to try to condense it down to 10 of what I think are the most important things you need to know in order to get nice flat panel glue-ups. Because the worst thing that can happen is when you go through all of this work, and you glue your boards together, and you come back the next day, and your panel looks like a potato chip. So we're going to do everything we can to prevent that from happening. Inspect your boards for cups or twists, and try to find boards that are already mostly flat. A board like this one has a really nice twist, and even after jointing and planing, there's a good chance it'll return to its warped state. So it's really not a great candidate for a panel. It's also a good idea to make sure that your wood is dry and well acclimated to your environment. I like to take new boards and keep them in my shop for at least a couple weeks to acclimate to the conditions in this space. Great looking panels don't happen accidentally. Make your grain arrangement purposeful. Most times I try to orient the grain so that it gives the illusion of a single panel. On my desk here, I took it a step further by intentionally butting up sapwood to sapwood so that the joint becomes harder to see. On this tabletop, I have two sapwood joints, and on this one, I've got sort of a diffuse sapwood joint, but it's really hard to make out where the joint actually is. Now, sometimes you could take advantage of the fact that you have a joint by doing something like a book match or a slip match. In this case, we've got a book match of a crotch portion of a board, and when you unfold them like the pages of a book, you kind of get this mirror image effect, which looks really cool. It's kind of like a dragon or an owl. When milling your boards, make an effort to count the number of passes so that you remove the same amount of material from each face. This should help keep the board balanced as it acclimates to the environment. You see, wood is a lot like a sponge. It readily absorbs and loses moisture. And if you think about the way a sponge dries, it's usually a little bit more wet on the inside and drier on the outside surfaces. So if we think about this in the case of a board, there's moisture in the center of this board. And if we mill it unevenly, we have an imbalance where there's a little bit more moisture on one face than the other. And that can spell trouble. Let me show you a couple of cool examples. So here I've got a small piece of veneer. It's about a 42nd of an inch in thickness. And really, veneer like this is just a, a very, very thin board. So we can use it to show how the wood can expand and cupping can occur. So just the way that this piece was rolled when it was shipped, we've got this natural curvature here. I'm gonna apply water to one face and that face will absorb the water and expand. And I'm going to actually not only flatten this out, but fully reverse this curvature. Just put a little bit of water on there. Let it soak in, give it about a minute. Now obviously, it looks a little bit gnarly, and if you do this long enough, you could see the moisture will go to the other face because it is that thin, um, but ultimately we reversed the orientation of that cup and went the other way with it. So pretty cool example, and you can see one we did earlier, just messing around, that was let to sit, and it actually completely rolled itself up back the other way. So in this example, I took two roughly identical boards. These are actually planks I used to make uh, alder plank salmon and uh, soaked them in water overnight so they became completely waterlogged. And I used this as an example to show what uneven drying can do. So for this board, I laid it on its side overnight and this lets air get exposed to all the faces, all the ends, uh, and it dries evenly. And as you can see, for the most part, it stays flat. This guy was treated a little bit differently. I dropped it flat on a moist sponge. And what that does is it keeps one side wet while the other side dries. So these fibers are kind of contracting as they shrink down and they pull the sides of the board up and you end up with a pretty wicked cup like this. Most people just check their jointer fence to make sure that it's 90 degrees to the bed. Unfortunately, a lot of jointer fences aren't perfect, so it's the result of the cut that really matters and not so much what you find on the tool itself. Now here's a cool trick that a lot of old school woodworkers know is that you don't actually need a 90 degree fence to get a perfectly jointed set of edges. I am purposely going to skew off of 90 to show you an exaggerated example. And if these are the two boards I wanna to join together, I'm going to fold them in like we're closing a book and make sure I joint them both in this orientation, right? So we'll start and do one board at a time. If you keep track of your faces and joint carefully, the angle cancels out and the result is a flat glue up. Even if you know your boards are coming off the joiner at 90 degrees, this is a good habit to get into as it cancels out even the slightest bit of error. 
Now, whenever you're gluing together two surfaces and those surfaces are loaded with glue, the pieces tend to slip and slide past one another, especially when you apply clamping pressure. And what that can do is result in one sitting higher than the other. So it's a good idea to use something to help keep these things nice and level. If you use biscuits, dowels, or dominoes, or even splines or tongue and groove joints, you can make your life a whole lot easier as the boards will stay nice and flush during the glue up. This sample panel is really small, but this technique is super handy on really large panels. And remember, this reinforcement isn't for strength, it's really just alignment. The glue joint is all you really need for strength. On smaller panels, you can actually just use a clamp at each joint to keep the panels flush. On larger panels, you might also consider using calls. These are simple strips of wood that are coated in wax or something like packing tape to prevent the glue from sticking. They sandwich the glue up, making sure that everything stays flat. Another cool classic call option is something called a cambered call. So instead of it being flat like the ones that we showed before, these actually are bowed slightly. So it's a little bit higher in the middle than it is on the outside edges. Now the genius of this is by clamping at the ends, by the time you get both ends clamped down, and I can't even do it with my bare hands, it's a little bit tricky, you need clamps. But by the time you have full pressure at the ends, you have a lot of pressure in the middle. This is fantastic on big wide panels and places where you can't get clamps into the middle of your panel, cambered calls are the way to go. Uh, these are commercially available, but you can obviously make these yourself. If your glue line matches the color of the wood, it's a lot harder to see the glue line and the panel just looks better. And glue comes in all different uh, varieties. We've got light colors here, all the way to something that's a little bit more grayish, and then straight up dark. This uh, type on dark is great for things like walnut. Um, and then of course other varieties are translucent and you don't really see it because it's kind of clear and the natural color of the wood will shine through. Uh, things like hide glue and polyurethane glue. And did you know that you can actually dye glue to a particular color? It's a water-based material, so a little bit of dye in there. And now you have a reddish brown glue that would be perfect for something like mahogany. One of the things you'll get the feel for over time is the number of clamps you need for your panel. Uh, but until it just becomes second nature, you could think about the 45s. Each one of these clamps applies pressure and that pressure radiates out. And you know, for the sake of simplicity, let's say it radiates out at a 45 degree angle. This is the coverage zone for this clamp, right? So what I like to have is a little bit of overlap in that coverage. And of course, we're going up to the first joint here. So the width of the board matters. So when I have a second clamp here and a third clamp over on this side, each of those radiate out at 45 degrees and you can see I've got some overlap. So I would say minimally for this panel, three clamps should do the trick. We have plenty of overlap. Now check out what happens when we have these narrow boards. That's a lot more clamps, it's twice as many to make sure on the 45s that we at least have coverage all the way across. And if you don't believe me, go ahead and skip one, remove one, and you're gonna find that you're gonna see more squeeze out here and here than you will here, which means it's uneven pressure. So it's always a good idea to have tons of clamps, and this is why we have a lot. Now something a lot of people don't realize is that some clamps do not apply even pressure vertically. So if they're all going in the same direction, and let's say it's just putting a little bit more pressure on that top edge, you could actually induce enough pressure to cause this panel to want to cup over time. So the way we get around that is to add a couple more clamps in the opposite orientation. Now, even though I don't necessarily need these for additional clamping pressure, it does even out the vertical pressure on the panel and just helps ensure that the panel stays flat even after it comes out of the clamps. Now, when you're ready to apply pressure with your clamps, something to keep in mind is applying that pressure slowly, one clamp at a time. If you hammer it home, the glue between there, everything just kind of slips by. So if you want to keep these nice and flat, and especially if you don't have the aid of calls, dominoes, biscuits, whatever, apply a little bit of pressure and move on to the next one. Push down so everything stays flat, but apply a little bit of pressure. And what you're doing is allowing the squeeze out to occur, getting all of the air out of that joint, and you'll find that the boards just kind of become real grippy and sticky. All right, back to the first one, that feels good, a little more pressure. I keep working my way across, giving it a chance to squeeze out. And now those boards are pretty much stuck together. I can crank down. Beautiful. If you let the glue dry on the surface and then try to scrape it away, the glue drops can take some wood with them causing tear out. If you actually look at the strip of glue that we pulled off of there, the entire back of that strip 
is coated in wood fibers. So I like to give my panels at least 30 minutes to set up before scraping away the glue. At this point, the glue is still flexible and comes off easily with a putty knife without tearing the wood or spreading the glue all over the place. Be sure to remove the glue from between the clamp bar and the wood to help prevent staining. Now when you take your panels out of the clamps, how you store them really matters. You don't really want to just lay it flat on the workbench and just leave it there. You're cutting off air circulation on one entire face. So it's a good idea, if you can, and if you could balance them, to keep the panels up on their side like this. That allows air exposure on the end grain as well as the faces. Uh, if that's not possible, you could always lay things down, and there's always a risk that this might get tipped over and fall. Um, lay them down on the bench, but put something down that props the end up. This way you still get air circulation. They're laying mostly flat, uh, but you give it an opportunity to breathe under there. And this works pretty well, certainly for an overnight. If for some reason you need to leave the panels for an extended period of time, consider stretch wrapping. The plastic will slow down the penetration of moisture into the wood or the loss of moisture out of the wood, and the pressure of the bundle will help encourage flatness. In this example, my boards are not the same. Most of the time I put a stack of the same size panels together. Uh, the, what, what you're seeing here, I don't know for sure, but that bottom panel might want to cup up a little bit because of the pressure, so keep that in mind. With any luck, the panels will be nice and flat when you're ready to use them. Keep in mind, if you're in a very humid shop, you also want to watch out for moisture accumulation and mold, but in Denver, that's just not a problem. Now, while I do try to minimize the time between the creation of the panel and the incorporation into the project, you don't want to leave them sitting around forever because things happen, I do want to give each panel enough time to fully cure. Remember, that's water-based glue. Water absorbs into the wood fibers and you want to give it enough time for that to cure and all of that moisture to leave the joint. And let me show you what happens if you rush it and sand the board too soon. When you first glue two boards together, the moisture goes into this joint and you wind up with some sort of microscopically swollen fibers here. It raises up a little bit and that will go down eventually. But if you rush it and you sand and get rid of it, it will be flat for a while. But then the moisture leaves and what you wind up with is a little divot in there as those fibers shrink down because you actually removed fibers that you shouldn't have. So it's a good idea to give your boards at least 24 hours to dry even longer if you can. So that's my top 10 tips for better panel glue ups. There's a lot more we could talk about, so here's some honorable mentions that didn't make the list. Be sure to protect your clamps. I apply a coat of wax to all of my clamps so that the glue just pops off easily. You could also apply some blue tape to your clamps before your glue ups, or simply lay down some paper. Consider another classic trick, the sprung joint. This involves making a tiny low point in the center of the joining edges. The idea is that by the time the middle comes together, we'll have lots of good pressure at the ends of the panel where the joints are most likely to fail if they're going to. If you have the time and material thickness, consider a partial mill process where you flatten the boards, let them sit overnight or over the weekend, and then go back and flatten it again just before glue up. This should help stave off unexpected movement issues. Now, just because I can't stop talking, here are a few things that you may have heard about that I really don't think are very important. A lot of people say you absolutely must have glue on both mating surfaces. I do try to do that when it's possible, but sometimes if you're in a rush, you only have time to get glue on one surface and then apply the clamping pressure. Personally, I think that's fine. I've never had a glue joint fail by only putting glue on one side as long as I put enough glue on that one side so that it spreads to the second. Some people believe you should clamp this out of your panels. I don't think it's necessary. I apply enough pressure to squeeze the glue out, to bring the joint together, and I try to make that consistent pressure across the whole panel. Squeezing any more just dents the wood. A lot of people will tell you that you should alternate the orientation of your end grain. I did not do that here because I generally don't do it. I really like to have the face of my boards look as good as they can look, and the end grain turns out to be whatever it turns out to be. Now, the idea behind this is kind of sound, uh, wood generally will warp or cup in a predictable manner based on the orientation of the end grain. So people think that over time, if they wind up cupping, you're gonna have one that cups up, one that cups down, one that cups up, and over the course of a big panel, the whole thing kind of stays flattish, but it's more wavy than anything. For me, I would prefer that if all this cupping is going to happen, I would rather have one big cup in one direction because I find that easier to then restrict with a table. If I have aprons, I can kind of suck it down to the table much easier than if it's this sort of wavy thing. Ultimately, if the place you put it is stable, the wood you used is stable, and you follow all these tips and tricks, you probably shouldn't have a problem anyway, but I don't worry about the end grain orientation. 
So of course, all of this is just my personal advice from my experience. You could find other opinions out there, and if your experience differs from mine, that's okay. Uh, you know, wood is a natural product, it moves, and our job as woodworkers is to manipulate it and mitigate the movement, or do things that allow it to move in a controlled way. And there's a lot of ways to get that done. So if you're new to this stuff and you follow all these rules and you get a panel that just goes haywire on you, well, guess what? Sometimes it happens and it's unfortunate, but it's part of the learning experience. Following these tips and tricks, you should have the cards stacked in your favor that your boards are gonna stay nice and flat, I hope. Sit. Good boy. Can you shake? Yeah, you can shake. Good job. <laughs>